In the years I've been teaching for 40 years. Can you believe that? I have been teaching 40 years. I'm 54 and I started teaching at 14. And when I was teaching at 14, I had people that was your age and I would have them say, I'll be damned if I'm going to learn it, you know, pay somebody to teach me something that's a third of my age. And so I had a really, but surprising, um, I started at 14, I had a full class at 14. And the way that that started was, is that I was in a art class at the time. And I was painting under an artist by the name of Ram Villa. And Ram Villa was a fabulous painter. He was an art teacher that painted very similar to Bob Ross. The way that he taught was similar. The teacher would go up there and they would paint along and all that. And I would go and paint along. God, I don't know, in the 70s at some, some point. I'm really dating myself. I'm really disappointing a lot of you, I know. <laughs> so so, uh, so we, would, we would go and, and he would paint and we would copy. And I was horrible at it. I was the worst one in the class. In fact, at the time I remember being 10, 11, 12. And my mom, you know, I, I shared this story before. I wanted to be a bowler. That was my big thing. I was an awesome bowler. I had a 230 average at, at 9. And so people all over town would come and watch me bowl. I was awesome. In fact, if I would have stayed being a bowler, I probably would be wealthy. I wouldn't be a starving artist. Not that I'm a starving artist. I'm not a starving artist. But actually, I'm not even an artist at all. I just play one on TV. <laughs> uh, now on YouTube. But anyway, so, so uh, my mom wanted to get me into class, in art classes because she wanted me to take over the family business and become a cake decorator. You have never heard this story? This is the back story. It's like, who is this guy who dresses funny? Yes, she's, Judy's getting comfortable here. Yeah, Have you heard this story before? <laughs> really? But cake decorating must be fun. Well, my father was in, you know, we owned a bakery in Lake Tahoe. And my father, that's where I was born and raised in Lake Tahoe. And I'm one of the few people that really could say they were born and raised in Lake Tahoe. Because at the time, Tahoe didn't have a hospital. And so everybody who was born in Tahoe got shipped down to Carson City, which is the nearest place. But the day I was born, it was a snowstorm. And so my mom gave birth to me in a doctor's office on Highway 50 in South Lake Tahoe. Now what's ironic is that that building that used to be the doctor's office is now the South Tahoe Art League building. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so if you go to Tahoe and you find the little Art League building, that's where I was born, in that building right there. Um, so, and that's why I love the snow. But anyway, so I, so I was born there and I took up bowling and I was really, really good at it, captain of the first place team and all that. My whole identity was brought up in that. People, I mean, I was in the newspaper every week and people would come down and watch me bowl. I mean, I've had a couple at this age, I had a couple of three, 300 games, which you have to have to get that average up to there. So I was, I could throw that ball like nobody else. But my mom was German and she says, I don't want to have a bowler as a son. <laughs> because you know, that's kind of like, you know, the music man, it's like, yep, well, sir, we got trouble right here in River City. Because they have a pool table. You know, it's kind of scheming and stuff like that. But bowlers make a lot of money. Yeah. I thought that was a good idea. But my mom, no, she wanted me to take over the family business. So my, my father was a cake decorator. And consequently, she thought, well, if I get into art, then eventually I could get into cake decorating. And then I could take over the family business. Well, that sure backfired on her. My father was like, ah, do you want to go down and sell your artwork down at Fisherman's Wharf? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, and I said, yeah. That seems a lot better than getting up at four in the morning in a snowstorm, going down and need, needing bread, trying to, you know, 
<laughs> no, I want to be an artist. On those shows now? I could be on a cooking show. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> Actually, I could have taken my father's business and turned it into, a, you know, whatever they do now with those businesses. But at that time, it wasn't a good idea. So I went into went into the uh, the art, and I was horrible. And I think the reason why I'm telling this story is because a lot of you kind of think that I'm like this wunderchen child that has all this talent. But I was, I was really horrible at it. Really bad. Um, in fact, I remember my mom, the first time I went out plein air painting, the teacher was giving plein air painting. And I painted a painting that got known in our community as the Bad, bad Dream in Green. And it was, a, and here I am, eight years old, nine years old, painting outdoors. You know, I've been doing plein air painting for a long time. Um, it was awful. In fact, it was so bad that my mom said, you will never take another art lesson again, ever. <laughs> and I didn't care, because <laughs> I wanted to bowl. And all the classes, you know, the, my bowling was on Saturday and the art classes were on Saturday. So no matter what she did, I, you know, it's like that, whatever we do, we pull you right back in again. So was, I was being pulled back to art, being pulled back to art again. So um, I sit in Ron Vale's class for a while, and really the worst one in the group. And then at one point I went, this was in seventh grade, I went to our local library. Now in Lake Tahoe, we're not exposed to galleries at that time. It's a little tiny town at that time. I never saw any other art to speak of. All I knew is what Ron Vela did and that other guy that had the big hair, Rob Ross on television. That's all I knew. And so I thought, well, Rom's a little bit better than that guy. So I'm doing good. But there I'm going through the books there and I stumble upon a book from Albert Bierstadt. Now this is when they just rediscovered Albert Bierstadt. And immediately I got a connection. The landscape that I was born and raised in, Lake Tahoe, uh, I could never see that landscape as art. I always thought art was a dumbed down version of what you saw. So I lived in this beautiful place and I was very fortunate. I spent my boyhood making forts, you know, swimming across rivers, tempting fate. Mm -hmm. There were times when I would find cabins that had never been discovered and I would go through the, their, their drawers. You know, these were abandoned cabins obviously because the windows and stuff were all broken and everything. And I'd go through their drawers and stuff and find old prospecting things and photographs from families and stuff and be intrigued with the history that are there. Um, down by uh, um, the Truckee Creek there, uh, there was an Indian village and they got a lot of pine nuts and that was their big thing. The Washer Indians would come up from Carson City and, and uh, collect pine nuts and they would have these large flat baskets where they would shuck the nuts and with the wind separate the nuts from the shells. We would find those all over the place and we'd play frisbee with them. <laughs> you know, it's, we're kids. It's like, oh, look at this, woo, you know, so. <laughs> so these wonderful baskets that were worth like thousands and washu baskets are one of the highly prized um, Indian artifacts you can have. And we're just washer Indians. And then we're just hurling them around like frisbees, but. Anyway, so, so I found this book on Bierstadt and I go, oh my God, that's where I live. And a lot of the paintings he did were uh, paintings of Lake Tahoe. And all of a sudden I realized that art doesn't have to be a dumbed down version of what we see. In fact, if anything, it's a mirror image of what we see. Painting actually is better if it's autobiographical, if it's about your life. And I got that at an early age. I really, really got that it's about the life that you live. And I know that when I see students like yourselves coming up with subject matter, what do I paint next? And I have, 
you know, like you said today, it's like, do I paint this and I paint this? You pull out things in the magazine. Yes, those magazine photos and stuff are, are interesting, but a lot of you are painting places you've never been or never seen. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. But the whole point was is that, you know, I found this Bierstadt at the time, and I'm still like 12. And I'm still trying to get to bowling classes. My mom's still trying to pull me out. And all of a sudden, I get this aha moment that art is autobiographical. It's about my experiences. I love nature, but I never thought that nature would be the source of everything, what I experienced. And so I immediately started taking these versions that we did in school with Ron, and I started you're studying them. I would take them and I would make the trees that we would just, you know, the happy trees with the fan brush. I'd go back in and I'd put in, and I'd look at, and this is where my plein air painting started to take hold, is that I would go outdoors and with a pencil and I would start very carefully rendering what I saw. And so I would go, okay, I don't know what a tree looks like. So I would go outdoors, I'd find a tree that was similar to one that we did in the classroom, and I'd go, so what is it that I'm looking at? And I would notice the trunk, but the foliage on this trunk had nothing to do with a fan brush at all. It was really much more complex. And the trees weren't lined up like a ladder. They actually all had variations of like a, almost a rhythm like this. And then, yeah, I knew that the branches were were smaller at the top and bigger at the bottom, but I didn't really know how the branches attached to the trees. And I wasn't really familiar with the, um, the spacing between the foliage and all that. And what you could see the dead limbs in between them. And how does an oak branch attach itself to an oak tree? And so I would carefully sit and render that in pencil and paper. And that's where drawing becomes really important. Drawing has little value as far as um, a collection of things that you're gonna sell. And if we actually think about how artists collect information, that's all that it, that it is. That's, that's all that our sketchbooks are for. Now, when we pass away, our sketchbooks are valuable because it's something that we did. But artists shouldn't have an attachment to their sketch like it has anything importance to it. It's just something that it's done. But in the process of sketching, you actually get to see in detail what you're looking at. If you're out there drawing, you should be more concerned with observing. Observations of nature. So the whole idea behind the whole drawing issue is looking at how branches attach to trunks, how rocks sit amongst foliage. And I started drawing this and then I would go back into my studio and I would make the corrections on these paintings. So I would look at this fan brush tree and I'd go, no, that's not the kind of, I, it's a pine tree, but it's a dumbed down version of the pine tree. And so I would very carefully go back in and put all the bird holes in where all the branches, and I call them bird holes because that's where birds fly through. Okay, some people call them sky holes. And I would put that in and I would see that. I would see what aspen trees look like. I would see how the branches would go on aspen trees. Not just the big mm -hmm. uh, squirrel hair brush going bum, 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 but very complicated. And I'd go back in and put that into my painting. So I would use the, the, this formula, that I, the formulaic painting, and I would put all the detail back in again. And I was like 12, 13 years old. Then I'd come back to class. And all of the students there marveled at what I had done. Now, Ram would come up to Lake Tahoe every two weeks and, and teach. These mature women that were in my classes at the time, um, who had nothing to do with me because I would get paint all over them. And, but these students would come to me and they go, could 
you show me how to do that? Because it was, everybody was kind of missing that. You know, how do you paint the bark crumbling off of a, an aspen tree? How do you make it look like bark's coming off of a tree? How do you observe like the thickness of a bark off of a tree? What does a rock look like instead of just a round shape? And so I went to Rama and I said, would you mind on the other weeks if the gals would come over to my house and I'd give them a few coaching lessons and stuff? And he go, no, it'd be good for you. You know, and teaching is, if you want to learn something, teach it. And even in my classes, I encourage my students to teach each other. Um, that's why I think my classes work so well, because there isn't this pyramid. Um, I encourage people to do that, because in the process of teaching it, you know it. You know, and even if you think you know it, you can't confirm it until you actually teach it. So teaching is important. So he said, yeah, go ahead and teach. So I started teaching. Well, everybody in the class who wasn't taking lessons with me at the time marveled at what these students were doing in my classes. And all I did was teach these people to see what was in front of them. And I'd have them go out and do sketches of trees and go, look at the tree isn't like a fan brush ladder going up. It's much more complicated and every tree is different. I can't tell you the amount of paintings that I see from students and it's like tree, 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 tree. It's kind of like what we talked about last week. It's like the same, same tree. I mean, have you ever looked at a forest? Imperfections are all over it. It's the imperfections that make what you see, not the perfect idyllic. In fact, if you think of a Christmas tree lot, those are perfect trees and that feels very artificial. So part of it is going outdoors to sketch to see what you see and bring it back into your paintings. It's not separated, it actually is part of the journey. So before you know it, all these other women started taking lessons with me on every other week that Ram was there. Well, they said, shoot, we're getting so much out of your classes. Why don't you teach full time and we'll drop out of Ram's classes? <laughs> so a lot of students did. from being the worst student in class to actually starting to teach. So I'm 54 now, so that's 40 years. 40 years I've been doing this. No, but I've learned things along the way. This is really a, so in the process of, um, so in the process of learning and teaching and teaching and learning, in fact, I started teaching down here when I was 20, 21. Judy started classes with me. And in the process, I was learning how to paint while I was teaching. In fact, I had lots of students. My classes were full. I was like one of the most prominent kids, or adults or anything, teaching in this area. Um, as I, I was getting better and better. Um, I was actually taking students out on plein air caravans to places none of them had ever been. You can imagine, 13, 15 women, 12 cars, traveling to Idaho and uh, Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon. Um, CB, with this before cell phones, CB in my car, CBs in all the cars. I had a, a, a car that would pick up all the stragglers. We had breakdowns, animal encounters, all this stuff, and everyone survived. And in that process, I was getting better and better. I would say that I had been teaching plein air painting for 10 years before I had a breakthrough, where I go, yes, that's it. I have finally done a full-on plein air painting. That took 10 years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are upset because they can't get it right away. <laughs> plein air painting is like one of the hardest disciplines there is. You know, if you can capture that, and there's a lot of rules that I've learned. Everything that I've done, I've learned. I've learned along the way. 